seek above all for a game worth playing. Oh, baby, this craft can take you Hello and welcome to another episode of Make Yoga Magic Again, the House of Mages podcast. I'm Daniel Cumming. In this episode, I chat with the dark oracle, Mia Moore. Mia Moore sees an oracle as someone who can access the invisible realm and bring back wisdom in a crystallized form. In this life, she feels to have mainly worked with three archetypes, those of the muse, the dakini, and the oracle. She feels these three also touch the three planes of existence, the body, the soul, and the spirit. She lives to impart these gifts upon humanity and dares you to reach out. As a dark oracle, Mia's main work is to be of service to that which is unknown and to constantly feel for that which is unknowable. To suit the theme, I'm actually not sure how I first came across Mia and what she does. I think someone may have tagged her when I first put feelers out about a year and a half ago when I was looking for mages to be featured on the podcast when I first announced my plans on creating the House of Mages. This was my first time connecting with Mia and we actually had to stop our pre-podcast chats because we were getting into all the juicy stuff too quickly and wanted to make sure we kept it for the podcast. I do want to give a little disclaimer for this one, Mia's internet connection wasn't super stable during our podcast, so it can go a little bit distorted and cut in and out during some sections, but this podcast is such a game changer on a lot of levels, and it's definitely worth the few little glitchy sections for all the cosmic wisdom that this amazing woman embodies and shares so eloquently. So without further ado, here's my chat with the dark oracle, Mia Moore. Today, I have a very, very interesting guest and a very interesting conversation. I think we actually started chatting a little bit before this and realized that we should actually start the interview now because we're getting into some pretty interesting topics and conversations. So I have Mia Moore with me today and I'll let her speak to what she would call herself and what she does and all the different uh, bits and pieces. So thank you. Thank you, Danielle. You put me on a tight spot there. Um, I, yeah, I really have shunned away from people, so I really don't know what to introduce myself as, but I'm starting to be known as the Dark Oracle in terms of the astrology that I do. And the rest of my work is very much in the the embodiment magic of cosmology and quantum physics level, which I guess I've self-titled myself as a mystic because it's more about just being the explorer of these realms that wait to be communicated and embodied and just taught to the rest of the world. So that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, beautiful. Evolving, shifting. I think like we were talking before, different personalities, different avatars, depending on the the work and the play that we're we're doing. Yeah, definitely. I've I've traveled the world, I've learned from various cultures. I feel like not so much individual teachers or schools as like, ah, oh, this these people here do it this way. These people here access divinity or spirit this way and these people do it that way. So I've I've studied the access points um, to kind of direct experiences of the divine. And then now I'm just making my own um, pathway to it, which is a lot to do with embodiment. Mm, definitely. Yeah, and it's tricky, hey, because 
you know, as humans, we want to categorize things and put them into boxes. And, um, and I think that works in, in certain ways to know where it came from. And, you know, we were talking earlier about the lineages of magic and things like that, but I actually read a book early, um, called Hermetic Magic. And they said early in the book, the true sign of mastery is to create your own magical system. But I think mm-hmm. to it as well is that it, it's creating a magical system that is also able to be used by other people. Um, because I think a lot of, you know, masters of their craft, they might have their own system of magic that works for them. But if they try to explain that to somebody else and how to replicate the effects and the results from it, they can't really do it. So I think that's a whole new level of mastery. And then I guess it can help you come back to your own level of mastery and reevaluate and, and all that sort of stuff as well. Do you find um, that happens a bit as well? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that hermetics because... Um when I started researching, so I came into it from a very kind of trans Himalayan perspective, introduced the concept of the black hole and kind of started to draw science into their lineage of the philosophy of metaphysics. And when I reached that, ever since I was a child, I was really fascinated by quantum physics and black holes. And, you know, I read the science. I studied the scientific philosophy of that as my base of trying to understand the universe and the cosmos so i feel like today especially the world we live in we kind of have to start incorporating science to whatever we're doing because it is is 95% of the universe existing if it wasn't for science telling us that there is this thing called dark matter and dark energy and yet it's been fascinating to me now in the past years, listening to science lectures about these topics and where the science falls short is that they have no guidebook to going into the the magical realm Mm -hmm. to kind of apply what they've learned to apply them. Like, what does this mean? Basically they're like left with that question. And we see a lot of scientists almost like fall into Buddhism or fall into another spiritual tradition because the they've hit a wall basically and yeah I've got my own theories of why is that but the thing I wanted to say was when I studied hermetic laws and I started to connect them with the quantum physics laws they actually parallel they actually work out Mm -hmm. so like that's a that's a one example of a tradition that's like eons long and ancient and still applies today Mm, yeah because as as i understand because i delved into hermetic magic for a couple of years but then i branched off in another direction and haven't really fully delved back into it but because it, it is already a synthesis right it's not really like a traditional cultural framework they've kind of t- assimilated the egyptian stuff and the greek but then they've taken what works and i think that's the key is like they've realized by then from their own practices what actually works like what are the essentials to a ritual and like what states of being do we need to be in uh in order to step through in order f- to make magic work and that's why i really like joe dispenza's work as well because i think he's just like quantified the steps that you need to take in order to make magic work but then the trick is the art of it, right? Because we all like different aesthetics. We were talking about aesthetics earlier. Um, and so I might like the aesthetics of like the Egyptian culture or something. Someone might like, you know, uh, someone might like to dress up like a Viking and carve runes and, and yeah. So it's like whatever kind of turns you on in that aesthetic, I think is, is the trick, right? Because yeah, you might go through totally. the things, but you might not have the same effect because your subconscious was bored because you yeah. didn't have the right aesthetic, so. Absolutely. I feel like from a child on, I was fascinated by outer space and like used to draw stars into my like notebook, like the actual physical stars and they're different, you know, like white dwarves and blue giants. And um, so I've always been like oriented towards that, like cosmos, but also the earth. So I haven't found a tradition that really goes direct into it as much as kind of the shamanic cultures go into the earth, but then like science really goes far into space. It's one of the best vehicles we have to like travel and imagine and journey with. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's the thing as well. It it kind of um, humbles, grounds us a little bit to think that even like all this cultural framework, mythic framework, all this stuff that we're doing. Yeah. We're really just such a small part of the, yeah. (laughs) 
yeah, that's another whole conversation. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but actually, it's all kind of linked to this as well because uh, what you're looking at sharing on House of Mages uh, is called dark matter, and um, but I think it's like the linking of the two, right? It's linking of the cosmos with the physical body, and um, uh, yeah, I love it. If you want to speak on that a little bit. Yeah, I want to bring in like one kind of really simple concept of like why is it dark and why is it matter, like these two aspects. And we often talk about light and dark and those being synonymous to good and evil. But if we just think the fact of light is everything that we see and everything that we know that exists, dark just becomes everything that we don't know everything that is invisible to us, everything that is not non-perceivable, basically, or beyond our knowledge of understanding. And the big question is that if it's unknown to us, can it be known? And how can it be known? Which is why I'm kind of like taking my own approach to it, which is if it cannot be understood by the mind or if it cannot be um, studied in a lab, can we like bring it in and use our faculties of just awareness and in like, you know, the enlightened faculties of non-dualistic traditions and magic to actually like go deeper into that and invite that into our experiential bodies and learnings. So that's the light and the dark. Dark is just what we don't know. And then the matter embodiment piece there's there's dark energy which is different and which is most of our universe but then the matter bit still has an influence on us in an invisible gravitational way mm. and that's all we really know about it it's just like it's something invisible that has gravity and therefore it influences forms and structures and how we actually dance in the galaxy or scale. So I've taken that as a sign of like, okay, well, there's something almost like there is something that's material acts with you know, has to have mass, has to have weight. And only if you have weight will you be pursued by gravity. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah, really. These little little snippets of the bigger picture. <laughs> so do you kind of uh, think of dark matter? So when I think of dark and light, I think of light has already chosen its form because you shine light on something, it's a perceivable form. It's like it's already decided what it's going to be for that moment at least. Whereas dark, it's, it's the matter, but it's the potential. Kind of that's what I think of like the void as dark matter. It's like everything mm-hmm. and nothing. So it's like a blank canvas, but it also contains every colour in it to paint with and you just have to kind of know how to restructure it is is that kind of how you perceive it or do you have your own way of perceiving light and dark um the way that comes to mind is light to me is you know we've had this era of enlightenment so everything's just been made into visible understanding with really worshiped science and all these traditions and study text and done our occultists work really well so like everything that we actually can know and is able like we are able to go there is light to me Mm. so light is able to just travel in the now wherever um and speed of light has been you know, the, the, the highest speed we can ever travel with. So there's all these science fiction books of like, yes, when we do that. But still, light isn't fast enough in the cosmic scale. So when you go into the realm of science and astrophysics, they're like, well, light is really slow. Like it takes light years to get somewhere. And what if you have a message to send to this galaxy from this galaxy? That's not a very practical way of communicating. So there must be something else going on. And in comes the dark, which is just to me, the language we haven't learned to communicate with yet. We know a lot about light. We know a lot about atoms and electricity and how magnetism works. And we don't know a lot about this good, and these like you know they're seemingly um like weak forces 
you're not going like, to instantly be sucked into a black hole as soon as you discover it. It's almost like that we know that we're somehow being pulled toward it. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm exploring it in terms of my body and how I react, especially on the dance floor. We spoke a little bit on this recording on how it impacts us in contact improv. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I never actually thought of it like that, the way that you described it. And yeah, that's, that's really cool. And yeah, like we, um, so yeah, for anyone who is watching who didn't obviously catch our little conversation before this, uh, we were chatting about contact improvisation. So um, I, as I perceive it, it's kind of like the dance of two different energies trying to find a third uh, way of being, I guess. Uh, mm. and yeah, just the idea of, um, yeah, I'll let you maybe speak a little bit on it because I, I prefer to hear your take on it. Um, so I guess a lot of my, my studies and my background of dance and embodiment started from ecstatic dances and going into places where people are just free flow dancing. It's like the first prerequisite is you're dancing your own beat and then you find someone else who's, you know, like dancing to that same beat. And it's like, okay, you start resonating with each other from a distance. And we've all had experiences of dancing with someone. Um, but when it comes into like contact, it's almost like you have to stop leading anything and you have to see something's going to happen. And your brain is going to like just change gears very radically into listening into complete listening of like, okay, where is this dance going to go toward? So it's just like, it, it has to be improv. There's no way to make up the steps for it. Um, and the interesting part that started happening to me, especially with certain dancers who had, I feel like just more ability to listen and really slow down and like really question almost at every turn, like, is this coming from me or her or like somewhere else? And that's when we created that third current, which is just the dance is dancing us and we are just the players of that invisible current. Um, so that was part of, that's definitely been a part of my kind of dark matter magic um, summoning of like finding that amount of mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I love that. So is it is your Dark Matter course focused on contact improv or it can it can be uh, like solo? Because obviously even in contact improv, we talked about, you know, you can start off solo and instead of having an actual human partner, um, other than doing it with your cat, you can do it with the ground or you do it with the wall. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. just the resistance. I think that's a piece of it, right? Like a, having like a, a resistance and almost like a, it still has a gravitational pull to a certain extent, but um, yeah, it's less variables in it, I guess. Yeah, I definitely recommend everyone to go and find a dance partner, um, but you can do all this stuff by yourself. And it's a lot of just tuning in, like acuiting our bodies to actually be more receptive and more able to understand which layer of us is coming forth and where are these, if we're like going as deep down to embody something that could be called dark matter, we need to strip away a lot of our own layers. And yes, we can do that as a self-practice and that's all like I offer a lot of practices for that. But in the end, I feel like the real testing grounds is going into dance floor or even just like into the marketplace. You can do this kind of camouflaged in just everyday life. You can go to the supermarket and try to like blend in with everyone. So the most wildest experiences I have of this is kind of like a room full of people and me try to just move according to resonance of everything that I'm feeling is happening in the room. So it's like I'm becoming the empty space, if that makes sense. Mm. And I'm like, or the black hole, let's say, and I'm just like absorbing people's emotions and states and like I, I can feel physically their postures. I can just like, oh, okay, like that person's a little bit tense and that person's really like relaxed. And so... 
yeah, I mean, I've done 10 years of practice to like learn how to switch instantly and be the echo chamber of whoever I'm with. So there isn't a lot of me that needs to express itself. I got bored and then and I go into those spaces. I just like empty myself and just feel what I can receive. And I use my body as the, the receptive, like the receiving, receiving antenna, I guess. Mm. So I would like definitely encourage experimentation in all cases, like go and find out for yourself. Yeah. I like that. So you can kind of like tap into the, the frequency of the energy that's already there. But then by doing that, you'd also be able to see what isn't there as well. The space around it, uh, the gap in it. It's interesting. Yeah. You, you've ever looked into Alistair Crowley's um, stuff, but there was, um, I don't know if this actually ever happened, but I read or heard of um, one of the things he did to kind of play around was he mirror people. You know, you can do this in sales. You, you know, you like if I'm sitting a certain way and I mirror you and then I change, then you, you automatically mirror me back. But he took that apparently to a point where he would like copy people without them even realizing. He'd copy their actions and really get into their body and just copy all their actions and believe that he was him. And then he could actually like move his hand and he like their hand would just fling and like knock the cup of coffee over or something like that. I don't know if that ever happened. But when you're talking about going through the market, and just kind of like, yeah, I just imagine almost like this like kind of dancing ninja moving around, kind of like playing with the energies and, um, yeah, but it just reminded me of that, of like when you were saying tuning into people's energy. Um, yeah, because who knows what the You can definitely start manipulating other people's movements. Like we do that all the time anyway. We mirror each other if we're, you know, on go against and it's, it's so easy to start to perceive that it's just like a flicker of your reality that turns on and yeah. like we have so many faculties of perception that we don't really utilize when we're just talking face to face um so yeah i definitely noticed I, I took a sidestep yesterday in the supermarket and this guy was like slowing himself down because I was doing that. And, you know, like we both had this moment of alertness, like who's going to go first. Um, even those little moments queuing somewhere, that's a dance. That's already like, Oh, our particles are interacting in space together. Mm. Yeah. I'm really interested that as well i don't know you've probably done a lot of different dance practices but one of the exercises they got us to do in ubud in bali was to close our eyes and move while the other person observed us and then we would switch in between wanting to have our own space so almost like repel them from dancing with us and then still move but then invite them into our space as well and then the person mm -hmm. watching would try to notice the difference in if there is there a shift, like a noticeable shift in energy from I want to be by myself to I'm inviting you in and things like that. And um, yeah, I'm really interested in like just learning how to perceive those subtle energies as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Have you done some of that kind of thing as well? It sounds like it from what you're. Yeah, I feel like my. So I did one year of study in dance movement therapy, kind of like the official academic. Uh, master's degree bat thing and then they told me I was too spiritual so I kind of and like a bunch of stuff happened but I kind of quit halfway I was like okay fine like I'll go and back to my ecstatic dance and my ritual dance and like experimentation in like just different you know like the whole world is playground to us it's not just the therapeutic environment but yeah when when I really studied the nervous system and how to synchronize and resonate with someone from a perspective of coming into resonance and coming into healing with them. It's a lot about just that listening, but even from a distance. So if there's one thing you can take out of this, it's just like, okay, what if I just drop all my agendas when I meet someone and really try to absorb their body language and, you know, even observing their breath and like their tension in the body. Because we have neuro, mirror neurons in our brains that will automatically pick up everyone's posture. Mm -hmm. So we are almost like we do instantly feel what they're feeling. And most of the time we're blocking ourselves from feeling that or experiencing that fully. Mm -hmm. But that's what 
all, you know, theater and dance and even looking at like watching Netflix is we're just like, you know, trying to be the character. So there is something in our brains that that actually gives us meaning. So yeah, doing that in most everyday life situations has definitely improved my emotional intelligence. <laughs> yeah, cool. I find as well with my contact, it takes me a while to like fully drop into my body. And I, what I find really helps, um, especially with the, the non-planning, is to close my eyes. Mm-hmm. So I was doing a contact improv um, class and I had my eyes closed for most of it. And I was fully present, fully in the moment. And I, I opened my eyes for a moment. And then I noticed that, so I was dancing with someone, I think my hand was against the back of her elbow and I had someone else who was kind of dancing on the floor around me. And the, up until then, I had no agenda, no plan or anything. As soon as I opened my eyes, I started, I, was, I, I, I noticed my, my, my chatter. So it was like, oh, should I, should I move this way? Oh, the person on the floor, should I start making my way down to the floor? And then how am I moving it? Because especially like, because when I'm dancing with women, obviously I want to make sure that I'm not making them feel uncomfortable and, you know, but with my eyes closed, there is no agenda. I have no idea where my hands are going, what, what part of the body and what most of the time. But as soon as my eyes open, all these kind of stories start playing out. And um, do you find that I actually haven't figured out a way to do that yet with my eyes open. Like I still, I still mm-hmm. find my stories playing out a lot of the time with my eyes open and I almost get into the space that I get in with my eyes closed, but most of the time I just close my eyes because it's like my go-to. Isn't that a great metaphor for um, when you're receiving light through your eyes? Cause the eyes are literally the place where you're like taking in information. Oh, yeah. Um you're enlightened through your eyes and then you take that faculty away and you're in the dark you actually start using all those senses of the body like I feel like yeah what you're describing there's no more difference between us in some levels when we really drop into a space where we're just like worms in a can basically that's what I sometimes call it as a warm-up exercise I'm like people just getting into that puddle um yeah, like it's also interesting to me how much eyes take us away from actual physical experience. They put us into the observer mode. So then as soon as you open your eyes in that situation, you're observing yourself doing that and like, you know, being like, okay, now I'm person again and now I have to interact in a certain way. Whereas eyes closed, you're just almost like a baby in a womb and you're just feeling your way through it. Yeah, 100 yeah. Yeah, and that's why I think I like it because there is no responsibility, no blame, no agenda, no um, social conditioning, conditioning almost. It's just just pure like in the momentness, and yeah, it's really nice. And I haven't really found I haven't found anything else that like yeah completely just drops me into the moment into my body like contact improv. And and as well, I think the people that have done both will understand the difference because even with like ecstatic dance when I'm solo dancing, I can still plan. There's just still, you know, I might close my eyes or move, but I'm in full control. So I can plan, I can stop if I want to, but with contact, like it doesn't matter if I, if I want to start moving this way, that could change any moment and I have to be ready. I almost have to be like paradoxical, kind of like fully in the moment, but then also ready to detach from it as well. Like I feel like I've learned so much about just the cosmos by doing contact improv. It's just like such an awesome metaphor for everything. Totally. I do feel like it should be something that's taught in schools or something that's just taught to everyone also because it does give you spatial awareness of who you are and what your body is and how you actually want to notice there's less boundaries broken within contact improv dancers. Like we have almost like, yes, we have an agreement that things lead to because we're in just watching. Um, but also actually seeing others and being more intelligent with that and like you know I'm like if I'm coming towards someone it's like just this minor touch and the trust that goes into that dance is just like it's yeah it's such a spiritual practice it's just like restoring my faith in humanity every time mm. ah yeah, I haven't done contact for ages. I just, I think we were chatting earlier about that. I haven't really been anywhere here. 
where I live that has it. So yeah, just talking about it. Cause there is, like you were saying, the whole consent idea as well, because yeah, the, all those exercises that they often do before and how to, how to express yourself non-verbally with consent. It just, and we were talking about earlier, I think as well, that when something eventually drops into your subconscious, your body is able to express it so much more efficiently. So making like verbal, but also like, especially non-verbal consent, a part of your body you can express that so much more if you're so used to like being able to like one exercise that I saw that they did at the start of one is they're like, who wants to be poked in the eye? And of course no one put their hand up. And so they go, okay, go to poke your partner in the eye and see what they do. Mm-hmm. You can move away or you can move them away. Or, you, you know, then you start to develop that energetically where like, I'll go to like dance with someone. And the moment I kind of look towards them, I'll know if they want to or not without even, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's weird. Yeah, so I think that part of the norm, like you said, putting it in schools. Yeah, just um, help. And yeah, just being used to touching, you know, just like even just like platonic touch as well. It's, there's, ah, so much we can learn from it. So much. It's such a mental health thing these days. Like I wish we were talking, like I wish there was more platforms for it and just, just to restore us into like, that's also our animal bodies and that's the way we communicate as like physical embodied beings touch and body language is actually like 95 percent of how we actually get along and how we communicate to others mm-hmm. this this mental chatter is a very small little fraction of it so i'm just like making these broad assumptions that it's the same percentage of space that's dark as is from our like mental point of view, the rest of the body. <laughs> well, it makes sense. We were talking about hermetic stuff before. So as above, so below, you know, as the cosmos mm-hmm. is mostly dark matter. So probably is everything that we, yeah, is everything, right? So, yeah. yeah. So my question, I guess, is with the, with the dark matter approach, what makes it the dark matter approach to dance and contact uh, as opposed to, the, the light approach. Sure. Um, yeah, I've, I, I also learned a lot when I was in Ubud. That's like the capital of contact dance and like seems to be where people migrate to really get their like full injection of it. Um, but I only found a few people, even within that community, that would really have this ability to listen. And then there's a depth that goes into it. So we can dance with our physical bodies. We can dance with our emotional bodies when we're like, you know, playing our favorite song and we're just like super in the mood and like everything, our body is just like, yes. Or it cries to certain tunes. Like emotional body is really activated by music in general. Um, But what I call my access point to a deeper place is the dark body. And it's something that, like I described, like I literally kind of stop existing. So there's a, there's a part of it that goes into that meditation and does the non-dual work of there is no separation between me and the space. So I can literally almost be invisible or I can be everything else around me without, without bumping into anything basically. Mm -hmm. Um, So the experiment of that is really, what I'm wanting to transmit is like, how do you actually get into your dark body? And it does involve some practice and meditation and, you know, just like, that's the, that's the hardest part of shedding the layers of who we think we are. Um, which is, you know, pretty commonplace these days. I feel like most people are like ready to do this journey, (laughs) let some parts of them go and die. But yeah, the more you can empty yourself, the better you will listen in any situation in life. And when you can actually sustain a state of almost like empty mind um, and like really give body the authority, um, that's where the magic really happens for me. Mm, Definitely. One thing I, now that I talk about it, I realize I haven't done it for quite a while, but one thing I used to do quite a bit if I felt really stressed out or out of my body, I would actually walk around my house and try to do things like make a cup of tea or something with my eyes closed. Cause it just, 
one, one, I think I've watched too many superhero movies like Daredevil and things like that. And I just wanted to gain superpowers. I thought if I can get really good at that and be a ninja, but um, also, yeah, it just made me really present um, and mm. just changed, changed my perception of everything. Yeah. Do you have any games that you like to play around? I guess that that's all going to come through into this course, I'm guessing as well, all the little things and that. And that's what I like as well, just play and trying to incorporate these things as well, because is it going to be parts in the course where, because obviously there'll be some way you dedicate time and practice and make time for it, but is there also going to be stuff that we could do like when we're at the market, when we're going shopping, little games that we can kind of play that weave into our day? So it's like it becomes like literally how we live and operate within the world. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, most of, I'm like, I really want people to blindfold themselves and take themselves out. But, you know, you obviously can't do that by yourself. Um, You're not like equipped like a blind person would be, but like then you realize how much information you get when that faculty gets taken off. So if you do have a chance even to do it with your kids or with your partners or your whoever, um, that would be one, just to learn about spatial awareness from not a visual perspective. Yeah, definitely. And that's when I, I actually realized sometimes, um, even when I've done contact with people or anything, I think I'm facing a certain way and then I open up and, yeah, it's completely different. Yeah. yeah. And then if you get a chance to, you know, being led into a place where you haven't been before, whether it's a forest or a supermarket or someone's backyard and you actually like get to explore that without eyes there's there's so much that becomes potential like almost like empty space is our potential energy I think we touched upon that at some point and we just didn't know it was there until we like we think it's there when we open our eyes and we physically discover it but is it really real like this is like as soon as I close my eyes, I'm back in the quantum realm where it both is and it isn't. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that's, as time goes on, like I've got my most, I guess to, to, to try to explain um, my idea of paradoxes is I know when I've started to embody something because I can, I can feel the paradox or when I try to intellectualize certain concepts, like it just, I just get an error code. It's just like this glitch. But then when I start to embody it or feel it, it almost like feels like this expansion and this both sides of things and I can actually feel it. But it's, it comes back to what we talked about earlier. How do you explain that as well? I think that's, that's the true art of it is trying to use metaphors and analogies and art and dance and movement to enable someone to feel the concept that our three-dimensional mind or our, you know, intellectual mind can't, you know, can't really explain or share. Yeah. So how do you, like, how do you try to, yeah, how do you find ways to do that, to get that concept across to people other than just trying to (laughs) do big, big, expansive body movement? Yes. But then it's like, but then it's like, shh. I, I've started to use, like, I, I run temples here in person that we get to, like, drop into that dark body and we get to practice together. Um, I do the playlists myself and I started to use a lot of weird space sounds and, like, just, like, sounds from the world, not music at all, basically, um, so that, like, you know, it's really easy, actually, to manipulate the brain if you know what you're doing. Like, it's so easy to change the frequency and change your mood. You know, like, you have all these binaural beats in your, like, YouTubes and stuff. You can just go and, like, click on a playlist to release serotonin. So, like, the brain's actually just one machine and we just feed it with something and then it does something. So, what I've used since the dawn of, like, my trans dance days is use music that will stimulate some quirky reaction in me i have a really intuitive ear in terms of listening for sound that will take me by surprise Mm. and i really don't listen to tracks many times in a row 
I'm like, okay, I'm, I consume them and I'm, I'm done with them. Like I've danced them, I've absorbed them. And then I need to dance to something completely different. So yeah, I feel like music does develop our intelligence again, our embodied intelligence, but we need to kind of challenge, challenge yourself to listen to something you'd never dance to. Mm. Whether it's a waltz or whether it's a metal, heavy metal song or whatever it is, like that will really shake you out of yourself. Mm. And do you think it's uh, similar to what we spoke about before where like when I opened my eyes, I started planning. Do you get like the same kind of concept where if you're listening to a track you've already listened to, you know what's coming. So you're like already trying to plan ahead. Um, where yeah. if you haven't listened to a track before, you have no idea what the, you know, it could completely switch. And yeah. It's-, it's probably one of the best partners you have in terms of if you don't have a contact dance partner, use music as your partner and let it like take you by surprise. Put on the most random list that you can find of someone else's mix. There's amazing mixes of DJs and stuff, obviously, but there's rarely DJs. And this is like a call out for anyone who's a music magician who like can create altered states through their playlists. I used to have one guy when I was studying dance movement therapy and like doing this in Holland, where I had a lot of raves. So I used to have a guy who was like my shaman DJ and he would just like push some buttons and like send everyone into another realm within 10 minutes. Um, sometimes you find that in Ubud as well. <laughs> like yeah. DJs have the ability to manipulate your state. Um, so I think that's where we really find access points again to further discovery. Mm, I completely agree. And, um, cause we haven't really chat. This is actually our first time properly, uh, chatting. So we haven't really, uh, touched on a lot of things, but I actually, uh, a lot of people don't know that, um, I started, I guess my spiritual journey through music production. So when I was 16, I started making beats. I started making hip hop beats actually. So cool. I, music and that just expanded so much because I realized like how influential the music was on me but then also on the other people and being able to change and manipulate that was just like like a sonic mage um was just amazing and it changed it changed my brain it changed the way I perceived the universe and um yeah so yeah we should definitely chat sometime more about that because um yeah I I, yeah sound is just so important like even on a subatomic level right like you know we're we're vibrating so you know it's like even in movies you know have you ever tried watching like a really scary movie with like James Brown in the background or something like that like some funky music just (laughs) so you know people aren't as uh, yeah you know the movies, like the have the music, is the, like often the main, main main important part. So, yeah, I will definitely share some stuff that I have on that because I I studied it when I was doing kind of my thesis about this, um, about like ritual use of like what are the elements, the key elements of ritual states, like liminal states, and like this, like how do we actually change someone in a like in a period of a few hours. Um, one of them was music. And then I went into studying what electronic music does to you. And it's just a like little brief snippet. Um, Electronic music is basically not made by man. It's made by computer. Like you can literally just, you know, like the computer will calculate stuff for you. And I'm curious what will happen when AI takes over our DJ booths. Um, but it does something to the brain because it doesn't exist in reality. It hasn't been played on an instrument. It almost deliberately stimulates the abstract thought faculties of the brain. Mm. So it doesn't have a physicalized expression until we go into the dance floor and we start to like move like robots. And, you know, like, especially if it is a beat that just stays the same for a long time, like, we that's our greatest connection to the AI realm. Like that's our greatest connection to understanding the cybernetics and the mathematics and everything that's alien to us because it is mostly composed or done by machine. Um, So yeah, there's also like quirky sounds and scapes and frequencies, but as soon as you introduce that human element, we drop back into our humanness. 
um I hope you've experienced some like really quirky electronic tracks there's like i don't even know where that came from well, kind of level yeah, of yeah i love to hear everything you can listen to yeah for sure cool it's so interesting too that like your what you said about um, the structure of a ritual because that's something that I'm really interested in and actually was going to be a really big part of House of Mages in general because I'm really curious to what is actually what's the stripped down essentials to a ritual as far as I like I kind of see it as like a, like definitive start a definitive finish and then some way to get yourself into that state and let it go because that's the thing as well that. Um, as I understand, especially from like ceremonial magic and hermetic magic, as soon as you ring the bell or you do whatever thing to start the ritual, like your muggle self is gone. You know, you are just full. Wizard mode, uh, witch mode, mage mode, and then everything you do in that is a magical act. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's short. And that's the thing as well because where I came from, I, I've been practicing pretty much solo for about eight or nine years before I even realized that this was a thing and other people were doing it like explicitly and, and sharing it. Um, and yeah, so ceremony is getting really popularized now, but I think also how do we find a balance between making it awesome and showy and fun and making an evening of it, but then also having that, that succinct effect and going through the psychological shifts that we need in order to make shit happen basically. Yeah. Um, and not just like, not just do the act and do, do all the nice things, but actually make the shift. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious to your whole perspective on that. Um, without going into big lecture, um, I guess some of the key points would be the intention of why we're going into it in the first place. Like a full moon dance is not necessarily enough to create a ritual. Um, it's like, it is almost like it, it'll, this liminal state that we're looking to go into this transcendental realm of archetypes and magic and wizardry. Um, I feel like you need to give up something to get there. So you're always coming with like an offering of yourself or wanting to expose something. And really like, I've always used my willpower. Even when I've gone to ecstatic dances, I was like, okay, I'm doing this for some reason or like something's really, stirring in me and I'm going to go and look at it. Like I'm making this dedication to myself that this is my offering to this altar of magic. Um, and usually something unexpected will happen. So there needs to be enough space. I'm a big fan of the unknown, obviously. So like, almost like there needs to be that drop where we don't know what's coming next. Like we're in this global drop right now of like, we don't know what's coming next. And that allows things to emerge. And like, that's really what I'm looking forward to. Like if a ritual is too planned out, as it is, do this, do that, it just loses the potency of like, we're, we're going to summon something to happen basically. And then we let go and that thing um, will take over, whether it's a current on the dance floor and we all become one, whether it's, um, yeah, I don't know what are other kinds of rituals you, you're into, um, whether it's a medicine ceremony, like yeah. the medicine takes over. But, um, yeah, there needs to be a lot of space in the middle to like, okay, we're... Yeah, I completely agree. And um, going back to that, like, as above, so below, I think that space piece has become bigger and bigger with me in general. I think that's why I like traveling because you said, you, you know, you travel the world for a lot. Uh, I leave my plans pretty loose with my travels to leave room for synchronicity. Um, mm. I think that's the thing, like, magic needs, uh, you know, space to weave its way in. If you're like, okay, ritual is here, 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 the magic's like, trying to get in it's like you're calling on me but there's no space left for me to weave the stuff around and um yeah i think that that piece is, is something i'm learning as i go along because i have been very just in my masculine a lot of the time it's like no things need to be structured and go like this and yeah there's, and then there's just no room for the magic to, to be called in yeah totally oh i've made travel decisions within like 
medicine ceremonies or like just free riding like oh I need to go to Africa now because I wrote it down like two weeks later I'm there yeah. um I love that space it's it shakes our brains up like basically all that's holding us captive is this and there's like the rest of the world out there waiting to interact with us mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all we need, right? We need just like the start and the finish and then everything that cut and the general intention and then everything that happens along the way. Like I've um, done some travels where I just make like a, like a silly quest or a goal. Like something's like unaccomplishable, but at least I have a, a start point and a, and a kind of like general gist or intention for the travel. And then just all the weird things that I that happen along the way. I uh, just, yeah. Yeah. I love it. And that's, and that's what I think. And I think that's, that was my next question as well. Um, like, what do you even perceive the word magic to me? Like, what is magic to you? You know, what is, you know, yeah. How would you perceive magic and how did you kind of get into that? Mm. If you would even call it that. Yeah. I don't really use the term a lot. Um, I feel like it's got this in my head. It probably has this like a bit of a woo woo reputation of like, I don't know, magicians, you know, like the illusionists. Yeah. Um, so, but magic in its like authentic sense that I can feel is almost that little kid like feeling of imagination, like anything's possible. So that's my connection to that realm of trying to get myself to just play, just become that child again who's like, I'm talking to my imaginary sister right now and she's saying blah 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 um yeah like the best kind of people I can get into that place with and then we can go on a journey or we can do something together and magic, oh, magic will happen the coincidence is to hail like something will be that almost stroke play and imagination mm -hmm. yeah, cool do you have a like a memory that would kind of sum up the epitome of that <laughs> um i can't think of any like particular moment that I could share. I feel like there's just like these, like look for coincidences. Mm -hmm. I've gotten into a lot of places in the world. Like I hitchhiked across Africa and there were so many moments along that trail that were completely just out of nowhere. We stayed in this luxury villa out of nowhere. We stayed on the side of the road out of nowhere. We woke up in paradise and it was always about just taking the road less traveled and, you know, questioning almost the same as the contact, just questioning yourself at every turn. Is this the way or is that the way to go? Mm. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And I think it, like, I, I find it hard to explain as well. And cause a lot of it is a very subjective experience because the actual event often isn't that, amazing but the the way that it's connected to all the other little events that have happened all those synchronicities um it's just it's almost impossible to explain it and i think it goes back to what you were talking about earlier it's just like the feeling it's not so much like the words it's not so much that happening it's just just the feeling that you get um and i think that's why sometimes it just is pointless to explain even to come back to like the hermetic stuff I, i'm trying to remember the those four hermetic principles or something i think it's like to know to will to dare and to keep silent. And uh, I think there's just so much insight in that, like kind of to know, like to actually like embody it. Like you, like they talk about gnosis, right? Like you, you think about it, you read it, but you don't know it until you embody it and to will it. Exactly what you're saying. The most important part in the ritual is your willpower. Without that, you're just going through the motions with no intention. And to yeah. dare to go out and like sleep on the side of the road in, ca in case something amazing happens. Um, and then, In case the baboons come. <laughs> they did. It was scary. We barked them away. Um, yeah. I mean, stuff has happened. Stuff has ha definitely happened. At every corner of the road, you've got that option. Yeah. 
So do you have a little like, so just say you were, you were traveling uh, and then you, I don't know, got a little bit stuck. You're in a difficult situation. Do you have a little like go to uh, calling on the universe, like imprompt uh, little sorcery kit or any, like any kind of thing that you would do to kind of like, all right, I need to get somewhere now. Or does it always just click into place? Um, or do you, um, do you have a little like, um, go to like sorcery kind of modality, if you would call it that? <laughs> Um, the, the easy answer is if you stand on the side of the road with your thumb up for long enough time, someone will pick you up and take you somewhere. Um, I feel like the thumb up symbol has really become that like universal sign of like, I'm hopeful, I'm here, I'm showing up, like I'm vulnerable, but I'm still like, I'm thumbs up, I'm happy. Um, so that's been one of my main go-to magic tools. Um, and the other part is I've had moments where I've like broken down on the side of the road, just like completely exhausted of travel and strangers and wherever situation I've been in and notice where the trauma comes from, like going in, back into the memory that it came from. And like one was about my father telling me something, I can't do something. So I was in this little girl place of I can't do this because my dad told me so I went to church to rectify the relationship with my father and like that was the closest thing I could find to the heavenly father you know Mm. and a whole chapter started from that place like it was almost like okay I'm just making um word associations mean something and I'm just going to find the closest thing that matches my definition of father and like needing to reconnect with him Mm. Um, and I'll just go and do that and that's almost like those are the little clues that I would follow and then you know end up meeting somebody who plays the guitar and I need a guitar and then I just ask him about it and he points me to this direction and you know the story goes on Um, so it's, it's literally following the breadcrumbs but intentionally of like okay i'm on this i'm on this quest i'm in alice in wonderland yeah yes definitely yeah i think uh, alice in wonderland is definitely a big um, influence on my perception of um the cosmos for sure <laughs> that's really cool though because um i mean that's how i kind of perceive uh like sigils and symbols and things like that it's like the the bridge to the actual thing it's like i can't literally affect the thing but I can affect the symbol and the but the symbol represents the thing and like mm-hmm. what, like you know healing your, your relationship with your father through the symbolic father and then and, and all these sort of things um yeah that's essentially what magic kind of is to me it's um interacting with your inner and outer world through sim- a symbolic system of your choosing whatever works for you yeah 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 cool I guess um yeah, my kind of like last question for, for this talk. Anyway, I think we have a lot more to talk about, but maybe on, a, on another chat. Um, if So imagine that you were 100% sure that when you, when you die, you would be reborn, but without your memories. And you, could, you had like a quick three-minute video that you could make in order to tell your, say, 16-year-old self something that would like quicken your spiritual journey, uh, do this, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. What would you just like a few things that you would say to that version of yourself in the next lifetime who has no memory and that you're like trying to give like quick little tips and tricks on, um, what can quicken their, their spiritual growth or even, yeah. Any of that sort of stuff. Does anything come to mind? Yeah. It's funny. I feel like I've had those moments in this lifetime. I was like, I had that famous Newtonian moment of being like almost an apple falling onto my head and I discovered the universe. Um, So I feel like that moment was look up, look out, like look beyond yourself. Like you are not the source of all of this. There's so much around you that's waiting to speak to you, communicate to you. Like, just listen. Mm. And then that's where it starts. <laughs> definitely. I agree. And I have definitely learned that as well because I would 
put out so many like orders to the universe, but then like I'd miss out on the delivery, the, you know, cause I was, I was looking at the next thing. Yeah. I'd put out questions to the universe, but then I wouldn't listen. So it just, yeah. So that's a big piece. I think that a lot of us forget we're always looking for the next thing um, yeah. we get to, to actually sign for the order that we, that we ordered last time. So. I started talking to different parts of nature on my travels. I was like in Luxor, I was, and the Nile started speaking to me all of a sudden. Like I wasn't really intending that to happen, but I was on a boat and I was crossing it and I had a question about the pollution of the river. And I just kind of like heard the river answer um, and had a whole dialogue with like old man Nile. He was really old kind of grandpa-ish energy of just being this oh, I don't mind, like, it's a little bit of dust and, like, different particles here and there, but, you know, I've survived quite a few millennia. Like, yeah, you can damn me and stuff. It's much more quiet. He seemed like this retired old fella. Yeah. Um, I was just, like, really baffled by my own experience. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I mean when I say everything's trying to communicate to you. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of, I, I read a book called Weird Wood. It's amazing. And it's about a uh, family and lineage in Kent in the outskirts of London. And they've looked after the forest there for hundreds of years. And they've just spent so much time listening to the forest that, yeah, they've just read about what, they, what they've learned from the forest and the trees um, in, in ways that, yeah, they just they wouldn't have if they didn't slow down and stop. And they, they, the way they talked about the trees is they just operate slower than us. So kind of like we might go and touch the tree and then walk off, but to them it's like an ant for us, just like zip. So we need to like slow down and really take time because they're trying to talk, but often it's just like a lot slower. So, yeah, I think because we're so used to the speed that we operate, um, we don't expect other modes of communication to operate in a different way. Oh, I think we're, we're expecting the universe to speak English to us um, or speak, you know, human language to us. Again, it's that 5% minority of how universe actually is. Mm. Yeah, cool. Well, yeah, this, is, this has been really good. It's, it's reminded me of a lot of different things as well because um, we were talking about, like, you know, reminding your future self or your past self I actually, um, I would love to know if you, you've done anything like this or even would be interested in doing because I'd love to do some like group rituals like this with the House of Mages. But I, I read about a group who actually sent a message back to uh, their self a year from now. So they, so just say like tomorrow you wanted to send a message back. No, sorry. They, they, yeah, so they did a year from now. So, yeah, I got it confused. So what they did, they'd start from now and they'd start listening for the next year and then a year from now they'd send a message back to this current day. So they're playing with the concept of like quantum time, right? So mm-hmm. they start listening today. So they, they listen for certain sides. They pick like ways and in, in, they decide now, okay, I'm going to interact with myself through birds or through this modality or through music or through travel and then they'd keep track of all the signs that they would get. And then a year from now, they would do the ritual that would send the message, if that makes sense. I like that. Yeah. Something like that. On it. Like, and, th- and that's the possibilities as well, like these huge grand scales of things um, that people can do and just testing, testing the bounds of, of reality. So, yeah. 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 Back to experimentation. Everything's free game in this world. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And I love the idea of calling it a game as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, is there anything that you want to summarize about the, 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 your Dark Matter course um, and just like your perspective on it um, before, we, before we finish? Um, I, feel like we've, I feel like we've covered some good terrain. Um, anyone who is uh, curious can also ask me questions um, whenever. Um, this is really like, like I said, like we're running a laboratory and the experience is somewhat different, but also I'm looking for that common denominator. So dark matter is just the name of the next 27% of the universe that we try to contact. Um, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm about right now. Cool. I love it. 
Well, thank you, Ian Moore, for sharing that's amazing. Um, is there any uh, links or any, any other way that you could recommend that people could get in touch with you other than the House of Mages site? Um, you can check out thedarkoracle.com for my private page. And yeah, obviously I'm on Facebooks and Instagrams as Mystic Mia Moore. Awesome. Well, we'll be able to find all her stuff on House of Mages. And um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing all your magic. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Make Yoga Magic Again, the House of Mages podcast. I'm Daniel Cumming. Thank you so much to Mia Moore for being my guest for this episode. If you're interested in more of what Mia does or what we're doing with the House of Mages, all the links are in the information section of this podcast, as well as the houseofmages.com. The House of Mages is a school of yoga, tantra, and the magical arts. To find out more about what we do, head to thehouseofmages.com or the link in the description of wherever you're listening to this too, and I will speak to you very soon. Make yoga magic again.